I woke up early this morning. My heart was beating right on time. I said, Lord, I truly thank you for opening up these eyes of mine. Then I went over to the window, and while I was peeping out the shade, once again I had to tell him, thank you, Lord, for letting me see another day. Now the sun was brightly shining, and the wind was blowing not too strong. And in a treetop just a few feet away, Brother Robin was singing a song. Now, I don't know what he was singing, and pretty soon he was on his way. But who's to say he wasn't being grateful, saying, Lord, thank you for another day. Now, I know that Robin had enough sense to say thank you, that I know we ought to have that too on this morning. Because I don't know about y'all, but I know I'm not the only blessed person in this house on this morning. And if you can't do anything else, you ought to be able to tell God thank you on this morning. Tell God thank you because he brought you through another year, brought you through dangers seen and unseen, brought you through tribulations and trials and circumstances and situations. If you can't open your mouth, you might as well just wave your hand. And if you can't say a word, you're deaf, you might as well just say that still said, thank you, Lord. You can give God a praise in whatever state you find yourself because God has been good to us. He's been better to you than you can think about being to your very own self. God is good all the time. Turn to somebody this morning and say, neighbor, God loves you. And I do too. And if you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break. I love in two. Good news. I'm yours now. God is good. God is good. God is good. I ain't forget about you, Richard. I ain't forget about you. I got a feeling everything's gonna be all right. Oh, I got a feeling that everything's gonna be all right. Oh, I got a feeling that everything's gonna be all right. Oh, be all right. Be all right. Be all right. Oh, well, I, I got a feeling that everything's gonna be all right. Oh, I, that every, oh, I got a feeling that everything's gonna be all right. Um, be all right. Be all right, be all right, because of Jesus done already told me that everything's gonna be all right. Oh, Jesus already told me that everything's gonna be all right. Oh, Jesus already told me that everything's gonna be all right. Be all right, be all right, be all right. I said, I, I got a feeling that everything's gonna be all right. Oh, I got a feeling that everything's gonna be all right. Oh, I got a feeling that everything's gonna be be all right, be all right, be all right, be all right. Amen. Amen. I am so thankful to the almighty God for this day, for just another opportunity that he has given us to come into his house and worship him. And then it's so good to know that you got a place that you can come to and you can lay your burdens down at the feet of Jesus Tell God about your issues and your problems and just praise your problems away. It's so good to know that, man, I might not be able to show out in Walmart or on my job like I want to. But when I come to church, I come to give God some praise and I come to give God some glory. Amen. For he is so worthy of it. I'm so thankful to be here this morning. And we just want to say um, welcome to everybody this morning that's visiting with us. You are an honored guest and we're just so glad to have you here on this morning for all of those that are watching this morning via live stream we're 
welcome you. You are just as much a part of this service this morning as we are. And we pray that you will be blessed throughout this service and reach out to us if there's anything that we can do to help you in your spiritual walk with the Lord. And come by and stop and see these folk here at 7009 Wilson Boulevard where the gospel is preached. You heard it from them. You didn't hear it from me. So come check it out for yourself. Did anybody come to hear a word from the Lord? That was half of y'all. Anybody come to hear a word from the Lord this morning? Amen. If you would, follow me to the book of John, the book of John chapter number 11. John chapter number 11, beginning at verse number 38. And we'll tabernacle at verse number 45. John chapter 11, beginning at verse number 38, concluding at verse number 45. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away. But the word of God shall stand forever. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. John chapter 11, beginning at verse number 38. You're there? Say, I'm there. And the scripture says, Then Jesus, being deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was laying in front of it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd, I guess it was from Missouri. We had to show them, Lord. But because of the crowd standing here, I said this so they might believe that you have sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in cloths. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had did, believed him. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, dear Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. Pray with me, if you will. Spirit of the living God, we thank you on this morning. Father, we thank you because we know you're omniscient. You're omnipresent, Father. You're everywhere at the same time. Therefore, Father, we know that you are in our midst on this morning. Father, here today, somebody needs you for one thing and somebody needs you for another. But, Father, we all need you right now. So, Father, we pray that you come and just sit with us just a little while on this morning. Anoint these lips of clay and hide me behind your glorious cross that no flesh will take any glory in what you ought to have. And at the end of it, Lord, we be so ever mindful to give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor of which you are so worthy of. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let us say amen. Turn to somebody near you to your left or your right. Don't look at nobody that looks stone-faced like they got a million problems going on in this world like they worried about something. Look at somebody like they came to give God a praise this morning and say, hey, I know you know how to turn up. Let's turn up your expectation. Now, now they, they still lagging from the turn up from last night. Look at the other one. Look at the other one. Look at the other one and say, hey, man, I know you know how to turn up. Now let's turn up your expectation. Rarely does a day go by that I don't have somebody in some way, shape, or form reach out to me and say, Preacher, I need you to pray for me because I'm going to surgery. Rarely does a day go by that somebody doesn't reach out and say, Hey, I, I, I got surgery coming up. I got this appointment coming up. I got this and that. I need you to pray for me. Now, if you've never had to undergo surgery, you really need to thank God. Because of, that, because of the grace that's been applied in that area of your life, because it's only by the grace of God that you didn't have some kind of surgery. And for, for those of you who've had surgery, you, they'll tell you that surgery ain't no kind of joke. 
The very fact that one needs surgery is a clear sign that there is some form of crisis going on in your body and something there that is unhealthy. And surgery calls or suggests that something needs to be replaced, that which is unhealthy needs to be taken out. And in most cases, surgery means that there's going to be some cutting. And there's going to be some, some suturing that must take place. And, and generally, after the cutting, there's going to come some bleeding. And, and after that bleeding, therefore, the aftermath, there's going to be some pain. And if there's something unhealthy is being taken out and something healthy is being put in its place, there's going to be some stitching or some staples, and it's a period of waiting to see if the body adapts or adjusts itself to what has been taken out and at the same time to what has been put in its place. And even though you know you're going to get better, the immediate effect isn't that good. Now, for those of you who've never had surgery, I want you to know that coming into the presence of God is just like having surgery. Because there's something in us that God got to take out of us that's unhealthy that the enemy has put on the inside of you. And other times it means that there's something unhealthy that your troubles have allowed to manifest in your life. And the spirit of God has to come into your life and it has to remove those things and replace it with something that is healthy. Now, the process doesn't always leave us feeling good, but it's necessary. We know it's going to get better, but when the word of God dissects us and when the spirit of God cuts us, because you know the spirit of God will cut you, right? The Bible says that the word of God is likened unto and is like a two-edged sword, meaning it cuts and divides even asunder to the man, cut you going and a coming. It's just like that. Word of God. So hear it when you get a ouch with the word of God, because sometimes you be told you can't shout out the word of God. Some messages that truth be told, it's a shame for you to shout off of. Sometimes all you can do is sit right there and in yourself say, ouch, Lord. Ouch, Lord. Because it exposes some things that we assume remain hidden, even when it's the source of the crisis that you got going on in your life. Because if we be honest, some folk don't want the Lord to open them up. Some folk don't want the thing that's in them that's unhealthy to be removed. And it's only a madman will want to hold on to something that's unhealthy. And that's jeopardizing their health and their welfare. Surgery needs to take place. Ask your neighbor, do you need surgery? Now, you might not know it, but somebody just lied to you in church. Because you see, if there's doubt in you, surgery needs to happen. If there's unbelief in you, surgery needs to happen. If there's hesitation, if there's unforgiveness in your life, surgery needs to take place. Now go back to him and say, hey, I'm back again. Do Now do you need surgery? If there's a crisis going on in your life, crisis going on in your spirit, in your finances, in your family or whatever it is, you need surgery. What you need is for Jesus to show up because Jesus knows how to perform spiritual surgery. And Jesus wants us to surrender our lives before it's too late so that he can correct the wrong in your life and replace it with something that is good. Now, now, now here we have Martha and Mary, two sisters in our text, and they needed surgery. Yeah, they was on the waiting list. They needed surgery. And their brother Lazarus had just died, and they sent word to Jesus, the one whom you love is sick. They didn't ask him directly to come, but the assumption was the nature of their relationship would make Jesus get in a hurry to come and see about Lazarus. And, and I mean, this is the same guy Jesus already knew that there was a crisis because then they said, your friend, the one whom you love is sick. Jesus said he'll sleep. I'll be there to wake him up after a while. No, you can't wake him, Jesus said, because this sickness is unto the glory of God. This crisis was necessary so people could see the full scope of my power. Sometimes when trouble comes into your life and crisis comes into your life, it's necessary to reveal how weak you are but how strong God is. 
based on the word of God and the character of his followers, you as a child of God have a right to expect God to show up in certain situations. And that's all that's happening in the text. Martha said we got a right because we are in relationship with Jesus. You have been to my house so many times, you just go in the refrigerator by yourself. Now you don't even ask me no more. They feel like they have a right, but Jesus stayed two days. You got a right to expect God to show up. Now, let, let me teach this just a little minute, and I'll get where you want me to be in, in a minute, because if, if you're in a right relationship with God, then there are some things that you have a right to expect from God. That's why I'm glad to be saved this morning. Yeah, I, I was half for y'all. I said, I'm glad to be a child of God this morning. I'm glad that I'm saved because there are certain things that I got a right to expect because of my relationship with the master. An unsaved person cannot say, Jesus, you promised me. An unsaved person can't say, Lord, you told me. God, you promised me. Our nation has been in such a strain because of the various issues that we have going on. But, beloved, I don't care what the government does. I don't care what happens because you are in a relationship with God. You will never see the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. God going to take care of his children. He said, I'll make a way for you in the wilderness and in the desert. Now, because of my relationship with God, I got a right to expect some stuff to happen. If you never expect a miracle, you'll never get a miracle. Tell them somebody, you got to tell somebody you got to expect something. Every now and then you got to get in God's face and say, God, you promised me. Now, it ain't that God forgot what you said. Or God forgot what he told you. Say, Lord, you said if I love you and walk up right, then when I called you, you'd hear my call. I have to get in God's face every now and then and say, God, I'm not feeling well, but you promised me. You were wounded for my transgressions and you were bruised for my iniquity. You promised me and I'm calling on you now. If you didn't want me to call you, you shouldn't have put it in the book. You put it in the word of God. If you didn't want me to call you, you should have never put it in the book. I'm reminding you. Of what you already told me. You told me that I can sit down at the same table with my enemies. And you will prepare the table. As a matter of fact, you make them pour my lemonade. They said, in fact, you'll prepare the table. You told me that my cup would overflow with goodness and mercy. And it's not that God forgot about you. It's just that when you come to God and you remind God of that, all you are doing is affirming the relationship that you have with God. Any of y'all ever prayed a specific prayer and asked God for some specific things and you've seen God give you specifically what you asked for? That is only a, that is only a sign that the relationship between you and God is where it needs to be. Because let me tell you, some folk call and he don't hear. <laughs> Some folk call and he don't answer. But I'm glad when I call, he might not show up when I want him. But I know sooner or later, God going to come and he's going to answer my request. So it's, it's, it's expectation. Every child of God ought to have some expectation. Stop allowing the devil to beat up on you all the time. Stop walking around with your head held down, always crying, always melancholy. Stop, stop buying into mediocrity. No, God has promised you more than that in this life. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm smiling because he promised me good. A life without expectation is a life without inspiration. Because inspiration is the genesis of my confidence. Lord have mercy. It's the genesis of my confidence. And when the sperm of expectation meets the egg of inspiration, it produces exhortation. When the seed of inspiration comes with the, 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 the sperm of expectation, it produces exhortation. What do you mean, preacher? What do you mean? And so even if I'm broke, busted, and disgusted, if I can get a word from the Lord, something to encourage me, something to lift me up, it's going to cause me to bless the name of the Lord. 
So in other words, even though it don't look like it, it's true. My faith says, yes, it is. Because now faith, tell somebody you got to have now faith. Now faith is the substance of things that we hope for. And it is the evidence of things that we cannot see. So I don't have to see it. If I can say it and God affirms it, that's all I need. And so, so, so Jesus shows up. He shows up and he realizes that he must do something to turn up their expectation. Because when Jesus heard the word about Lazarus, he didn't send them a word. He didn't tell them to hold on. He didn't send them a, a blessed cloth. He didn't send them no miracle spring water from the pool of Siloam. He didn't send them nothing. He didn't even send them a word of comfort or cheer. The same Jesus that walked the streets of Jerusalem and healed strangers and opened blinded eyes did nothing when he heard about Lazarus' death. But when he heard about it, he said, this sickness is not unto death. Lord, that's enough to shout off right there. The conclusion of the matter is not going to be death. Even though it looked like it, smelled like it, even though it appears to be, the conclusion of the matter is not going to be death. Anybody in here that's ever faced an uncertain situation ought to be shouting right now because what looks like a dead situation don't look that same way to God. And even though you think you'll never make it, it don't look that same way to God. Because he got a all power in his hand. So when he heard about this situation, he tries to turn up the expectation. In verse 11, after he had said this, they said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I'm going now to wake him. Here he's talking to his disciples. And they replied, Lord, if he sleeps, will he get better? Jesus had been talking about death. But they thought that he was talking about natural sleep. So again, let me turn you up a little bit more. In verse number 14, he says, let me make it a little bit more clearer for you. He said, he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Then he turned around and said, for your sake, I'm glad I went there. So you may believe, but let us go to him. He tried to turn up their expectation in that verse, and it seems like they didn't catch it. They didn't get it. He tried it again when Martha ran out to him and said, Jesus, if you had been here, she was a sister. If you had been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but Jesus tries to turn up their expectation. And he said, listen, you're going to see your brother again. She said, Lord, I know I'll see him again. I've been to Sunday school. I heard about the general resurrection. I know I'll see him again in the last day. And in the resurrection, Jesus said, you're looking at what you're looking for. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. And he that believes in me shall never die. I am the resurrection. So here it is. He said every now and then we got to turn up our expectation. Turn it up real quick. He said, I am. I am the resurrection. So what I have is something simple. Now, I wish I wish this morning I had for y'all some deep theological system or strategy to turn up your expectation. I really wish I did. If that's what you're looking for. I ain't got it. I ain't got it. I ain't got it. I ain't, I ain't got it. That's what you're looking for. I got something plain. The only thing I know to tell you is when you're facing these kinds of situations, grab a hope to you a verse of scripture and stand there until God shows up. Stand there until God shows up. Grab a word. Look back over your life and see what God done done for you before. And if he did it then, he bad enough to do it now. So when the master... So what the master does is he turns up their expectation until it gets to the point of a miracle. Jesus says your expectation has to ascend that which is impossible. 
when it gets to the place of the impossible, that's when God shows up. As long as you can handle it, ain't no need in God coming to help you out. As long as you can figure it out, you're pretty good. But once it gets to a place that you can't do anything about it, once it gets beyond you and your intellectual understanding cannot comprehend it, once you get to that place, God will manifest a miracle, but you got to turn up your expectation. When you face it, you got to say, I know God got this. I know God will do it. I know God got the power to do it exceedingly and abundantly above all that I could ask or think. Tell somebody you need to turn up. God will turn up the level of your expectation until you have a not unto death testimony. When you lost your job and career, thank God it wasn't unto death. When your relationship fell apart, thank God, it wasn't unto death. You thought you'd never love again and had trust problems. And when others stood by and said, this and that ain't going to work, and it wasn't unto death. When you give your best effort and you still fail, thank God, it was not unto death. When it seemed like he had hell had come to visit you and wasn't going to leave and everything that you had worked for fell and fall apart, thank God that it was not unto death. Told you don't pray anymore. You're in your bed of sickness. Folk drew up your funeral plans, but thank God. That it was not unto death. Jesus turns up the expectation. He who believes in me. Though he be dead. Yet shall he live. So he says. He says to them. Jesus shows them. He said you know what. I'm going to turn y'all up a little bit higher. He says I'm going to turn up your expectation. He says. Show me where you laid him. Jesus turns up their expectation. He says, open it. They said, Lord, are we opening? You're going to smell something. You don't want to smell this. He's thanking, Lord, and still Jesus said, open it. Every now and then, Jesus will bring you to a place where all he tells you to do, open it. Lord, I ain't got no money. Lord, it ain't enough to go around. Lord, my life is over. I feel like a failure. Broke, busted, and disgusted. Open it up. Every now and then, you'll come to a place where you think you'll finish, and God said, all you need to do is open it. Because we don't know what's going on on the other side. But God knows what's happening on the other side. See, God knows the beginning from the ending, and he knows the ending from the beginning. So God tells them, open it. And when he rolls the stone away, they said, Lord, this situation is just so bad. He said, open it. And he called Lazarus by name to turn up their expectation. Lazarus came out bound in funeral clothes. The garment of death, the garment of death is never appropriate for those who live with resurrection hope. The garment of death is never appropriate for those that live in resurrection hope. You see, people, there's a difference between activity and living. There's a difference between activity and living. So often, people are dressed up, but they're dead. They look good, but they're dead. Driving a luxury car, but they're dead. A member of this and that and that and this, but they're still dead. Auntie got gator shoes on, but you're still dead. Alligator this and alligator that, but you're still dead. That's why Jesus said, listen, that's why you had to roll the stone, because I want to raise him. But you got to, first of all, loose him. It's not enough to just come out the tomb. You got to be free enough. Cut his hands loose. Cut his feet loose. Take that tape off of his mouth. I want to hear praise coming out of his lips. Now, you may not realize it, but somebody sitting beside you ain't saying that all morning long. 
good as God been to them and brought them to 2020. I know they think they got here by themselves, but it was the Lord that brought you here this morning. And the reason you can't say nothing is because you're still bound up. You're still locked down. But when you serve God, you got to take that tape off of your mouth because the Bible said, let everything that have breath. The Lord has been good to you. Ain't nothing wrong with giving God a prayer. This is God's house. This ain't your house. So since you are in his house, give God the respect and the praise that's due to him. If a president walked in here, we stand up. Oh, thank God for the president. When you before a judge and they tell you to stand. Yes, judge, I'm standing up. I'm standing up. Anything where when any kind of person comes, a respectable person comes around, you stand up and you give them the praise and the admonition that is due to them. But I'm talking about somebody that woke you up this morning and started you on your way, put food in on your table, the very air in your lawn. He put it there. He deserves the glory. So, 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 so there's something that. When I come into the house of God, see, I might not, as I said, I might not be able to praise God on my job, my good government job like I want to. Because, you know, they'll, they'll call somebody in there to remove me off the job. And, you know, I can't, I can't praise God like I want to in Walmart and at the dollar store because they'll think I'm crazy. And call somebody in there, get this fool up out of here. They done lost. They mad. But when I come into the house of God, I leave all my worries. I leave all my cares on the outside because I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus and I purpose in my heart. I'm going to praise him. Something in me make me want to clap my head. Something in me make me want to tell God, thank you for what he has done. He turned up the expectation. He raised some things so he could release some things. This situation looked hopeless, but Jesus shows up to let them know that there is no expiration date on the power of God. There's no expiration date on the power of God. They, they got in Jesus' face and said, he been dead four days. But God says, there's no expiration on my power. I don't care if he's been dead four weeks. I don't care if he's been dead four years, four millenniums. I don't care how long you've been dead. I don't care. There's no expiration on God's power. And it's so good to know that no matter what I face, my God got power. Tell somebody, my God got power. Yeah, yeah. What you thought was dead and wasn't going to happen, even though you had closed the book on it and you co-signed that this was dead, God can bring life to it. God can still bring resurrection to it. God can still turn up your expectation. And everybody in here this morning might be facing a dead situation. It looked dead. Smell dead. But if you let Jesus perform surgery on you and let Jesus turn up your expectation, you can look at that situation with your hand on your hip, get right up in his face and let it know my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand all over ground. So he said, he said, he said, I know, I know it looks dead, but God can still bring life to it. I know, I know it looks crazy and everybody's saying that it ain't going to happen. And they're encouraging me to give up on it. But Jesus said, I'm going to turn up your expectation. They said, uh, they said, they said, wait, they said, they said, they said wait, if, if you hold on to the promises of God, the promises of God remind you they are eternal and everlasting. Jesus said, show me where you laid him, because I want you to realize that death has already lost its sting. And the grave has already lost its power. Do you know who I am? I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the ending. I was before there ever was or was. Do you know who I am? When my God created the universe, I watched him put the stars in the sky. I applauded him when he spit out the seven seas. Do you know who I am? I watched my daddy give wings to the bird and then turn around and give him a flight pattern. Do you know who I am? My daddy can look 
look at the grass and the grass will grow. My daddy can blink and the tides will rise. Do you know who I am? I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. My God is everything. Jesus says, show me where you laid him. Because I want you to realize I have already conquered death. So, 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 so he says, he says, he says, it's time for you to turn up your expectation. Tell somebody you need to turn up your expectation. You need to turn up your expectations. Turn up your faith in God. He said, you don't know who I am. He said, I'm bred in a starving land. I'm a bridge over troubled water. I was water when you were thirsty. Do you know who I am? I was Moses' rod. I was, I was David's battle axe. I was Joshua's sword. I was David's prey. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? I am the same God yesterday, today, and I'll be the same God even forevermore. In Genesis, I was the word of God creating the heavens and the earth. In Exodus, I was the Passover lamb whose blood was sprinkled on the door of your heart so you could escape the bondage of slavery. In Leviticus, I was the temple, the place, the holy place that you go to meet God. In numbers, I was your ever-present God, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, I was that coming prophet that would be greater than Moses. In Joshua, I was the conquering warrior that would lead you safely to the promised land. In Judges, I was the unlikely savior that rise from weakness in order to rescue you. In Ruth, I was your redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, I I was your shepherd king who rushed out the face of giants all by himself. In first and second king, I was your righteous ruler. In first and second chronicle, I was the restorer of the kingdom. In Ezra, I was your faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, I was the rebuilder of the wall. In Esther, I was your advocate in the throne room. In Job, I was your living redeemer. In the Psalms, I was the one that hears your cries. I ain't done. I just need to catch my breath. Fast. In Proverbs. In Proverbs, I was wisdom personified. In Ecclesiastes, I was the meaning in the madness. In, in the Song of Solomon, I was your lover and your bridegroom. Man, in Isaiah, I was the son that we born who be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, the one that will be wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities. And the chastisement of my peace would be upon him. Do you know who he is? Do you know him? Do do you? Do you know who he is? This morning, he wants to turn up your expectation. This morning, he wants to level you up on this morning. Because where you are right now is just not sufficient enough. All of us in here could be just a little bit closer to God than we are right now. All of us could be just a little bit nearer and nearer to God than we are right now. What is it? What area of your life is it that you are limiting God to where you think God cannot do anything? Some of us have put dead on a lot of situations in our life when we really did not come before God and ask God to work out those situations. But God this morning wants you to take him back to the place of your pain. Take him back to the place of your misery and your strife and your defeat and go back and God I said, show me where you thought I couldn't do anything. Show me where you thought I was too late. Show me where you thought I could not do a miracle. I'm finna turn you up if you'll give me a chance. Lord, from what we see, he did. From what we see, there's nothing else that can be done. He threw. It's been four days. He ain't coming back now. But I'm so glad. The song, there was a song that said that we're too close to the mirror to see what God sees. I'm so glad that what we see is the total opposite most times of what God sees. Where we see defeat, God sees just another opportunity. Where we see sickness, God sees healing. Where we see hopelessness, God sees hope. God always has a better perspective for us. 
But you got to turn up your expectation. Stop limiting God. It ain't God ain't meant for you to just sit at the house looking like Aunt Jemima eating on potted meat and sardines and crackers all your day. God, had the, the scripture said that he said, my prayer for you is that you would prosper and be in good health. Stop walking around with your head held down like you ain't got nothing to be happy about. Like you ain't got nothing to be joyous about. Like you ain't got nothing to thank God for. You are God's child. I want you to remember that. You are a child of the king. The spirit of the living God lives on the inside of you. How dare you walk around looking defeated like you ain't got nothing to be excited about. Let God turn up your expectation. We're looking for it to come this way. God said, no, I'm going to send it from another way. And aren't you, aren't you glad, aren't you glad that God waits until situations have gotten beyond your control until he shows up? Because if he showed up before time, you think you did it by yourself. And then you go around, look at what I did. Look at what? was able to accomplish. You ain't did nothing. It was God that gave you the ability. You ain't even getting your car and crank it up this morning. It was God that gave you the ability to go out there and crank up the car, to get in it, to drive here, get out, walk up in here, give a name and pray. It's God that's giving you the ability to do that. We do not direct our own steps. That is the Lord's doing. Who, who, who this morning needs God? to turn up your expectation. You need God to turn, turn up your expectation. Turn up, well, may, 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 maybe you say, well, man, preacher that sound all well and good. I came here on this Sunday morning, man. It's a new year. I decided I'm going to give this God thing another chance. Last year didn't look too well. The past few years of my life, they ain't been too hot, ain't been too good. But I just decided, hey, I might as well give this God thing just another opportunity. Well, I'm so glad that you have given God the chance to turn up your expectation. I'm so glad that you have given God the opportunity to show up in your life and show you just what kind of power he got. Let me tell you, my God got the power to speak to a valley of dry bones. And before you knew it, the toe bone getting connected with the foot bone and the foot bone getting connected with the ankle bone and the ankle bone getting connected with the leg bone and the leg bone getting connected with the knee bone and the knee bone getting connected with the thigh bone and the thigh bone getting connected with the hip Hip bone and the hip bone get connected with the backbone and the backbone get connected with shoulder bone, shoulder get connected with the neck. God can turn it up. But you got to give him an opportunity. God wants to work in your life. He wants to show himself mighty in your life. But what I love about him is he gave us something before the foundation of the world. He gave us some called free will. Meaning that he's not going to stick you up to come serve him. Whosoever will let him come. It has to be a decision on your part to allow God to come in your life and to make a change. And let me tell you, I'm not the only one that can testify to you this morning. There's several other people in here this morning that have tried Jesus and they can tell you that the man is all right. We, we ain't just looking at the table. We have tasted and seen and we know that the Lord is good. We know what God got the power to do. You need to try him for yourself. Don't take my word for it. You need to try God for yourself. And I tell you, I tell you, this will be the best decision that you have ever made in your life. Let me tell you, I don't care how good your job is. You might be on a job. You got all kind of retirement benefits, IRA, RRA, WRA, AW, all kind of stuff. You might have all that good stuff, but let me tell you what. Let me tell you what. Being a child of God, you got the best benefits that you could ever expect to get from anywhere. Because guess what? You don't just get to live off the benefits on this side. But when you get on the other side, oh, God. When you get on the other side, you are still living off of the benefits of God. So as a child of God, when you depart from here, you simply move from an earthly level of God's goodness 
to a heavenly level of God's goodness. And let me tell y'all, I'm so glad God didn't make me wait to get to heaven to be blessed. I'm living a blessed life right now. Uh, somebody say, I ain't just living my best life. I'm living my blessed life right now. I, I'm thankful to God because he has been good. Better than good. So give him a chance this morning. Give God an opportunity. Why is it that we'll try everything else, give everything else a try? Give God a try and let him work in your life. And let me tell you something. I'm, I'm not going to stand here by, by, by any stretch of the imagination and try to console you by telling you something like, hey man, girl, when you become a child of God, and he's going to take your feelings and wrap them up in cotton so every time you fall, you don't get hurt, you won't scream. It doesn't work like that. As a matter of fact, the scripture assures you that you're going to suffer some things in this life. He says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but, ooh, that's a bad word right there. Right? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver them out of them all. So that scripture affirms to me that just as well as I know I'm going to experience some things, I also know that I'm going to come out of some things. So therefore, I can face the circumstances of life. I can face my trials and my circumstances with a smile because just as they showed up, I know one day they got to get away from here. So you're going to experience trials in your life. You're going to be tested. You're going to be tempted. Just because you become a Christian does not mean that life's problems end for you. As a matter of fact, the problems increase in your life. Because when you belong to Satan, what kind of work does he have to do for you? He doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to work hard for those that belong to him already. All he has to do is continue to give you the same old pseudo love that he's been giving you all these years to make you feel like you're right and to make you feel comfortable. He doesn't have to do anything. But once you make up in your mind, I'm leaving all that behind to follow Jesus. I want God to work in my life. That's when devil wake up. He said, oh, now we got another one. We got another one that's trying to be about Christ. We got another one that's trying to live for God. So what can I do? to bring them down? What can I do to tempt them? What can I do to trap them? And that's why it's important, as I said at the beginning of the lesson, that when you're going through trials and tribulations in this life, that you grab yourself a verse of scripture and you learn how to wait on the Lord. If you be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. It is written, thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. When you are tempted by the devil, you need a thus saith the Lord on the inside of you to be able to combat the devil and his test. So who need to turn up this morning? Who, who needs God? Who needs God to elevate your life on this morning? He can do it for you. He can do it for you. Let me tell you, there's nothing that this world has to offer you that's going to be better than what God got for you. Nothing. Nothing. God going to take care of you. And he's going to look out for you. And you'll be able to say like David, I never sin. Never, that's a pretty strong word. Never means there is no evidence of the contrary. I never sin. The righteous forsaken. Neither his seed begging for bread. That means if, if a loaf of bread becomes $20 a loaf, guess what? God's going to make sure you have $20 so you can get that loaf of bread. If, if a carton of milk become $30 a gallon, guess what? God going to bless you with two or three dairy cows to put out there in your yard. So when you need some milk, you can just go out there and get it when you need. I never seen the righteous for sake. God will make a way for you. How many of y'all can attest to that this morning that God will between a rock and a hard place, he'll make a way. Between I don't know and what I'm going to do, he's going to make a way. Between I can't find it and here it is, God's going to make a way. God will. He'll make a way for his children. He'll make a way for you. Give him an opportunity to show himself mighty in your life. You know it's not by accident that you're here this morning. You didn't just happen to stumble into this place on this morning. 
didn't happen like that. It, you didn't just stumble in here this morning. It was divinely orchestrated by God before the foundation of the world that you would be here on this morning because there was something that God had in store for you. Are you going to take advantage of it? Or, or are you just going to let the opportunity pass you on by? Are you going to let it pass you by? Because let me tell you, he's been thinking about you. You've been on God's mind. The church is not an afterthought. The church is God's first thought. The church is not God's plan B. The church is God's plan A. Before the foundation of the world, God had already purposed in his mind an institution, a body, an organism, a living and breathing function to where his children could become a part of it. And if they would remain faithful, one day they would be able to live with him forever. And I'm glad that I woke up this morning knowing that I was on God's mind. I didn't just wake up thinking about him, Deacon, but he was thinking about me. As a matter of fact, you know, he sat by my bed all last night. Plenty of times I could have stopped breathing. Could have had a heart attack in your sleep. Stroke, aneurysm, anything could have happened. But God was standing right there by your bedside all last night. Oh, and here it is about this morning, about 6, 7 o'clock. He said, get up, boy. Time to wake up. It's another day. That's a blessing. So since he thought enough to let you live, to see, how many of y'all thought 20, 30 years ago you'd be in 2020? Truth be told, God should have been took you away from here. But yet and still, I'm still here, I'm still here. Still here. Tell some, tell somebody next to you. You might not like it, but I'm still here. Oh, Sister Thorne said, Oh, you still got to put up with me, Brother Thorne. Because guess what? I'm still here. Still got to put up with because I'm still here only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God. So, my, my brother, my sister, don't put off today for what you have plans on doing tomorrow. God gave you this day for you to make a choice. God gave you this day for you to make a decision. What's going to be your decision? Are you just going to go throughout another year like you've always done, playing Russian roulette every day of your life with your own soul because you don't know around which corner death lies for you? Oh, man, I ain't but 20, 30 years old. They die. I ain't but 40, 50 years old. They die. I don't care who you are, and I don't care how you, you know, there's a song that said, the leaning tree ain't always the first one to fall. While you're young and strong, God just might call you home. Man, don't play with it. This is a serious thing. If you lose your soul, that's it. This ain't 2K. You get mad, Richie, because you're getting beat. Then you want to restart the game, quit the game, leave the room, man. Richie, you know, you're, you don't you know, do that. Get mad because you're getting beat. Want to restart the game so you can get another try. It ain't like that with God. You get one life chance, but every day God is giving you another chance. Today he gave you this chance. He gave you this opportunity. Don't let it pass you by. Why not come to Jesus this morning? Give him your life. Surrender to him. Make him your master and your Lord. And let me tell you, you'll be happy. You'll be excited because God is going to take care. He's going to take care of you. As I said, he founded his church, his body before the foundation of the world. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 31, it talks about how the word of the Lord is going to go forward out of Jerusalem. And it will begin there on the mountain at Jerusalem. And then we read about Job talking over there in Job chapter 2 where he said, In the last days I pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see vision. Well, Job, when is this thing going to come about that you're talking about? It came about on A.D. 33, there on the day of Pentecost. It said you had Parthians, you had me. 
Phoenicians, you had Eliamites, you had dwellers in Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, and Asia. They were all gathered together there in the upper room. And the scripture says that it came down a sound as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the place where they were sitting. And it sat upon them, cloven tongues, like it on the fire. People looking at them and said, are these men not drunk? They said, these men are not drunk as it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was prophesied by, the, by Joel. They get on down in the verse and Peter began to preach the sermon to them and let them know that they had crucified the Lord of the world, that they had with wicked hands had crucified and slain him. And the Bible said that after Peter got through preaching the word of God to them, that they were pricked in their heart. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they heard the word. They believed it. After they asked Peter what to do, he told them, repent. Confess, Lord. Confess him as your Lord and be baptized for the remission of your sin. It ain't that difficult. It's so simple that even a child can understand it. He made it that way. So why not? If you stand a guilty distance away from the Lord this morning. Let me ask you a question. You ain't got to say nothing. If God called your name right now, if you had, I ain't got to say that. If you had to question it, you need to be coming to Jesus. If, if there's any doubt in your mind that your soul is not right with God, you need to be coming to Jesus because this may very well be your last time. This may very well be your last opportunity. Don't let it pass you by. And if you're here and you're already a child of God, but you're in sin on this morning, you're no different than all the other billions of people up on this earth. Scripture says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it's so good to know that when we do sin, that we got a big brother that's standing at the right-hand side of God, and he's interceding on our behalf. You remember when you was little, you might have had a big brother or something. Somebody mentioned, oh, I'm going to get my brother on you. I'm going to get my sister, Baby D. I'm going to call Baby D on you, you know, whatever. Come, but I'm so glad that when I get in trouble, I can call God. I can call Jesus, and I can let him handle my troubles and take care of my situation. Shout out to God, if you're here this morning and you stand in need of salvation, you stand in need of the Lord, this is your opportunity. Don't let it pass you by. Don't put it off. This may very well be your opportunity. God gave you this chance today. Take advantage of it. Come to Jesus while the blood is running warm in your vein. Come to Jesus while you're still in your right mind, while you still have the activity of your limbs. Stand to your feet. Come. Come to Jesus now. Come to Jesus. This may very well be your last opportunity, your, your last chance. Don't put off today for what you plan on doing tomorrow. Come. There is one.